Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hope. And this is our regular weekly message. And today is the first day of Suicide Prevention Week on the World Event Calendar. Our message today is entitled, Suicide, a Real Pandemic. No doubt that suicide is a very difficult tragedy. It affects hundreds of thousands of families every year and it seems to be raising its ugly head more and more these days. According to the World Health Organization and the Global Burden of Disease, a study estimated that almost 800,000 people die from suicide every year. That's one person every 40 seconds. That is not a small number. That's a staggering number. And if that number holds true, approximately 37 people, give or take, will be dead by the time this message has ended. The cause? Self-inflicted suicide. That would make suicide a real pandemic. So I want us just to take a quick look at, at a biblical worldview on suicide. Join me please as we go into our message, Suicide, a Real Pandemic. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 19. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live. God himself has placed life and death before each and every one of us. And he is asking, no, I believe he's pleading with us. Choose life. God wants us to choose life and not death. He has no pleasure in death, not even a death of a sinner. God has no pleasure in death. He does not force life upon us though. He doesn't force us to choose life, but he offers life. And it's up to each and every one of us to choose that life that he offers. God is pro-choice. He gives you the choice to choose right and to reject the wrong. He gives you the choice to choose blessings or curses. He gives you the right to choose life or to choose death. God is the author or the originator or the giver of life. And that is why he himself can set before us life, which he desires for us to choose because it is his to give. Life is his to offer and it's also his to take whenever he sees fit. Now let's turn to the scriptures to prove who the life giver is, to back up what it is that I just said. Turn with me please to Acts chapter 3 verse 13 through 15 and see what Peter said about the whole thing. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate, when he had decided to release him. But you denied the Holy and Righteous One and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. And you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. Peter said that Jesus, the Son of the living God, is the author of life. Therefore, neither death nor the grave were able to hold him down. Death cannot hold life, just like darkness cannot hold or cannot shut out the light. Death has no power over life. Therefore, that is why Jesus could, could, could not stay in the grave. He had to come forth after the allotted three days. Then Peter says this 
is not hearsay. It is not rumors, neither is it gossip, but we ourselves are witnesses to the fact that Jesus was raised from the dead because life, the life, was in him. Now, if Jesus is the author of life, and the life is in him, and Jesus is God, and God has set before us the choice of life and death and wants us to choose life, it is pretty clear that it is not God who is pushing suicide. Jesus himself chose to die, that we might live, that we might have life. But then he chose to live again. He said that no one takes his life from him, but he laid down and he had the authority to pick it up again. And which he did on the third day, praise the Lord. Claiming that death had no hold, death had no power over him. There's several recordings of suicides in the Old Testament. One, Abimelech. Abimelech was a suicide assisted death. Look at Judges chapter 9, verse 52 through 54. Samson also committed suicide while, while carrying out his God appointed calling. You can find that Judges chapter 16, verse 29 through 30. Saul and his armor bearer both committed suicides. Saul because he was mortally wounded and his armor bearer because he saw that King Saul was dead. 1 Samuel chapter 31 verse 3 through 6. Ahithophel committed suicide after his advice was rejected by Absalom, King David's son, King David's rebellious son. He went home, put his affairs in order, and then hung himself. 2 Samuel chapter 17, verse 23. Zimri, when he saw that the city was taken, he went into the citadel of the king's house and burned the king's house over him with fire and died. Then the scripture said that it was because of his sins that he had committed doing evil in the sight of the Lord, walking in the way of Jeroboam, and for his sin, which he committed, making Israel to sin. The only recorded suicide I could find in the New Testament is Judas, who went out after betraying Jesus, hung himself when he saw that Jesus was condemned. Suicide was not something that the early church practiced. They delighted in their salvation. They rejoiced in their suffering. They endured persecution. They laid hands on the sick and the sick recovered. They cast out demonic spirits. They did, did not allow harassing spirits to dwell in their source of influence. They preached the good news with boldness and with gladness of heart. They received the word of God. There was no place for suicidal thoughts. Jesus consumed their everyday life. It was Jesus. It was all about Jesus. The story of, of, of Job is an interesting one. And Job's wife makes an interesting statement. But first, I would like to quickly lay a foundation for those of you who might not be familiar with the book of Job. The book of Job says that one day the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan tagged along with them, Job chapter 1 verse 6. But to make a long story short, God asked Satan if he had noticed his servant Job. Satan indicated that he had, but Job was too well protected by God. So God removed the hedge of protection so that Satan might try Job. And, and that Job would be tried by Satan. And he put everything that Job had, he put it, all his possessions, he put it in the hands of Satan. So Satan stole Job's finances. He killed Job's children. But he wasn't satisfied with that. He wanted to destroy Job as a person. He wanted to destroy his whole identity. He wanted to destroy 
Job, because this thief comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. So God gave him permission, but he told them, you can't kill him, but you can do whatever you feel like, because Job is someone that I trust. He's a man of integrity. He's a man of God. So Satan went out, he afflicted Job with grievous boils. He, is, he afflicted Job so much that Job was hard to recognize because of the great suffering that he was enduring. But in all of that, all of that suffering, he would, Job would sit amongst the ashes and he would scrape himself with pottery trying to get one little bit of relief. Because his, his burden of pain was so much. But in all of that, Job still held on to his integrity. So when Job's wife saw how great Job's suffering was, she said in Job chapter 2, verse 9 and 10, Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, You speak as, as one of the foolish women would speak. Shall we receive good from God? And shall we not receive evil? And all this Job did not sin with his lips. Curse God and die, his wife said. But what did she mean by curse God and die? Some believe that Job's wife was telling him to give up, give up and die. But if she was telling him to curse God by taking his own life, what if die? What if she, she was saying curse God, meaning Commit suicide and get out of your great suffering. But Job was not impressed with that idea. He said, that's crazy talk. That's just crazy talk, woman. I'm not listening to your foolish advice because it's the height of stupidity. Job had settled in his heart and in his mind that he would accept whatever God gave him. So whether it was good or whether it was bad, he would give thanks to the Lord. To do any less to Job would mean that he would throw the gift of life back into the face of the life giver. Job was not an ungrateful man. Job would give thanks in all situations. But that didn't stop Job from feeling sorry for himself. It did not stop Job from complaining about his situation. Job chapter 3, verse 1 through 12 says, After this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. He did not curse God. He cursed the day of his birth. And Job said, Let the day perish on which I was born, and the night that said, A man is conceived. Let that day be darkness. May God above not seek it, nor light shine upon it. Let gloom and deep darkness claim it. Let clouds dwell upon it. Let the blackness of the day terrify it that night. Let thick darkness seize it. Let it not rejoice among the days of the year. Let it not come into the number of the months. Behold, let the night be barren. Let no joyful cry enter it. Let those who curse it or who curse the day, who are ready to rouse up Leviathan, let the stars of its dawn be dark. Let it hope for light, but have none, nor see the eyelids of the morning, because it did not shut the doors of my mother's womb, nor hide trouble from my eyes. Why did I not die at birth, come up from the womb and expire? Why did the knees receive me, or why the breasts that I should nurse? No doubt, Job desired death. He felt it was better to die, die than to live in the existence that he was living. But through it all, Job chose life. Some folk want to, to know, is suicide a sin? Will it be condemned the person to the lake of fire? Well, as we established earlier, God is the author and giver of life. 
But this is what Jesus said about Satan. In John chapter 10, verse 10. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that you may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. See the contrast between the two? It's obvious that God wants life. The evil one, the enemy, comes to, to steal, to kill, and to destroy. If we're obedient to Jesus, we will live. And we will live an abundant life. If you hearken to the voice of the thief, he will bring death. The scripture says in Romans 6 through 16, do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? Now here is another scripture that is worth reviewing. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 through 20. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God. You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Paul explained that we are no longer self-owners. We don't own ourselves. We have been purchased at a price when Jesus purchased us with his own blood that he shed on Calvary. Now, we are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. So think about it. We are we allowed to desecrate God's temple? And to solidify it, we are commanded in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20. Glorify God in your body. Paul says, glorify God in your body. This is not a suggestion. You are not allowed to do whatever you feel like with someone else's possession. That is why thou shalt not kill is the sixth commandment. The life we live is not our own. Therefore, we are to take that which is entrusted to us and do whatever, or, or we, we are not allowed to take what, what is entrusted to us and do whatever we want with it. That is called embezzlement. When somebody gives you something and entrusts something to you, and you take it, it is embezzlement. Paul, writing, bound with Roman chains, said, Rejoice! And again, I say rejoice. Could it be, then, that when people commit suicide, that they're saying that there is no way out of their situation because there is no hope in Jesus? Therefore, there is no reason to rejoice, and there is no reason to go on living. But if you or someone you know and love are suffering with suicidal thoughts, I would like to suggest that the very first thing you do is to take it to the Lord in prayer and fasting. Have the elders of your church anoint you. Have them pray the prayer of healing over you. For the prayer of faith will heal you. Here are some options. If you're feeling suicidal, call your church for counseling. Or get in touch with a Christian counselor. Call a family member or a trusted friend in times of desperation, when you feel like you just can't hold on any longer, call someone. Call a family member. Call a loved one. Call a trusted friend. And talk of life. Talk of living. We'll, we'll post the National Suicide Prevention Hotline, the 1-800-273-8255 number. We'll post that below. Here's a website, we'll also post a website with the top 10 suicide prevention organization and resources. 
We'll post that below. Depression and anxiety are a real thing. And it's a real threat. According to the Anxiety and Depression Association of America, there are, are an estimated 14.8 million adults ages 18 or older who had at least one major depressive episode with severe impairment in 2020. And that's just in the U.S. alone. This is a real pandemic. And it needs to be taken seriously. If you have a friend or a co-worker or a loved one you think may be suffering from suicidal thoughts, here is what to look out for. According to the helpguide.org, some of the warning signs for suicide or the warning signs for suicide include the following. Talking about suicide or seeking out lethal means, preoccupation with death, no hope for the future. When you see these things in someone you love or someone you know or someone you're close to, take close or pay close attention. Believe that things will never get better or will never change. Self-loathing self-hatred, feelings of worthlessness, feelings of guilt, feelings of shame, feelings of self-hatred, feeling like they are a burden. Everyone, they say things like, everyone would be better off without me. When you hear people saying things like that, pay close attention. When you see people getting their affairs in order, like making out a will, giving away prized possessions, making arrangements for family members. When you see them saying goodbye, making unusual or unexpected visits or calls to family members, calls to friends, saying goodbye to people as if they won't see them again. Maybe they, they might be preparing. If you see people withdrawing from others, when they're acting self-destructive, sudden sense of calm, when they've been all hyped up, when, when, when they've been, been in deep depression, and all of a sudden they have this sense of calm, it could be that they have made a decision to attempt suicide. Watch out for these signs and act, save a life. So in closing, I would like to say that Jesus is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above that which we can ask or even think. Jesus is able to deliver us out of all things, and all things mean all things. Put your trust and hope in Him. What is impossible with man is certainly possible with God. So I want to ask you, do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Would you like to know Him as your Lord and Savior? Here's how. All you got to do is to say this prayer. Say this prayer with me. And mean it. Mean it in your heart. And believe the words. Believe that He will save you. And Jesus will. Pray this prayer. Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for shedding your blood that I might live. Help me to live for you with rejoicing that in all situations I might rejoice. Lord Jesus, I come in the authority that you have given me on behalf of anyone who might be watching and I rebuke that spirit of suicide and I speak life. I say live, live. The Lord God says live. The Lord Jesus says live. The Holy Spirit says live. 
thank you, Lord Jesus, for the free gift of life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you pray that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. I'm, I, I'm suggesting that you get yourself a Bible. Read your Bible every single day. Get a highlighter. Highlight the promises. Highlight those things that encourage you and that you might live. Live the abundant life. Find yourself a Bible-believing church, a church that believes in the power of the Holy Spirit, that God still moves in signs and wonders and miracles and healings. Join that church. Be discipled in that church. And when Jesus comes back and find you doing what it is that, that you should be doing, he'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Now enter in. And we'll be with Jesus in blissfulness where there'll be no more depression, no more sorrows, no more pain, no more heartaches. For we will be with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, forever and ever and ever. I want to say thank you so much for joining us. I hope that this message was a blessing to you. My name is Kenny Yates. This is Hold the Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.